All right, I'm going to preach a message this morning unlike any I've preached before. And as I was thinking about that, I saw a number of uh, uh, new faces come in, people who aren't usually here, family from out of town, uh, even my in-laws came in, and uh, I'm thinking, well, this is not my normal message, but uh, that's what you're going to get today anyway. It's Christmas time, and uh, I find this year, not only because of COVID, but so many other things, I have heard this, I'm not really in the mood for Christmas, or I'm not really feeling the spirit of Christmas, or I'm just not feeling Christmassy. I've heard that a lot. I've, I've dealt with that, and I've heard that. I have, uh, I've been pastor for 17 years. I have, um, usually through the Christmas season, I have um, a couple Sunday mornings to preach. I have a couple Sunday nights, usually around a musical or a play or a cantata, to give a Christmas message. I have a Christmas Eve service. I have uh, a Christmas dinner or banquet here or somewhere that I'm usually speaking at. Not so much this year, but in the past I have. And so you get, you know, seven, eight different Christmas messages um, over 16, 17 years. And you've kind of covered Christmas. And so, you know, you kind of go through and rework some of those and use those different ones from, from time to time. But not so in 2020. 2020 has been such a unique year. I've, uh, last week, this week, I'm preaching things at Christmas time I've never preached before. And uh, I think the Lord's laid new things on my heart as we come up against new challenges in 2020. And that idea that maybe we're not in the mood for Christmas or not in the spirit of Christmas. I want to talk about the, the spirit of Christmas. I have a lot of folks in our church this year. We have a lot of folks in our church this year that are going through a Christmas unlike any they've had before. Um, several have lost their spouse in the last few months, and so they're going through a Christmas this year without, um, without their spouse, and it'll be the first time. We have a couple in our church, uh, uh, at least two that I can think of this year, that have gotten or are getting divorced. And so likewise, they'll be going through Christmas this year that's different from Christmases that they've had the last uh, number of years. Uh, we've had folks that maybe you're not able to travel, because of the restrictions, because of health. We have some that are dealing with some serious health issues. We have some that, you know, your, your children are estranged. I've talked to some folks this morning before the service who aren't going to be with their family because of uh, problems in the family. And so as I talk about Christmas and we talk about the spirit of Christmas and we talk about the, uh, the mood and the uh, fun of Christmas, uh, I think I'm talking to a lot of people in our congregation this morning that just aren't feeling it. Listen, Christmas is a, for, for those of us that are here, if you're here this morning, Christmas is an extremely important spiritual day for us, right? It has a very important spiritual meaning. And yet on top of that, let's be honest, on top of that, Christmas is our largest national holiday. It's our largest recognized worldwide holiday. It is the holiday where we tend to have more time off work or with the family, uh, where we spend more money and have more stuff and probably eat more food and do all those things at any other time of the year. So there's a sentimental layer to Christmas as well. And so that's why I said I've never really preached this before, but bear with me. I'm going to try to, try to tie those together this morning, the, the nostalgic and sentimental side of Christmas that comes with being with family and loved ones and friends and, and things like that, along with the fact that as Christians, this holiday has such a, a, a different level of importance to us than any other. Christmas has always been, I wrote down on my notes, Christmas has always been a day to remember. Obviously, right? Because we're remembering the birth of Jesus Christ, and we're remembering something that happened 2,000 years ago. And we're remembering that manger scene, and we're, we're remembering those shepherds and the angels and Mary and Joseph and that first night and, and all the things that go with that. We really focused on that last Sunday morning. And so clearly Christmas is a time to remember and to reflect. But I don't know. I, I'm a sentimental guy. Most of you probably realize that. I don't mind shedding a tear every now and then. And so I, you know, emotions, some of you laughed at that. I, I, 
write your name down. You've been naughty or nice this year. I got it now. But I, I, listen, I, 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 I'm sentimental, and I, 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 I reflect on that. And I, I was thinking about Christmas. Even in my own, own home, I went through a bunch of different stuff this year that's going on in our church family and among the people in our church that I know has weighed on your hearts as you're coming into this Christmas season. Not the least of which is everything that's going on with COVID and how it's affecting your, your jobs, uh, you know, your, your travel, your family, your time together, school, all those different things are being affected by that, and we understand. Um, you know, it was our, uh, you know, it was our dog that passed away two weeks ago today that kind of changed the mood in our house, you know. Um, and, and to be honest with you, I decorated everything in our house inside and out by myself because nobody else in our house was in the mood and still aren't. You know what I mean? There's just this, uh, if I don't turn on the Christmas lights, nobody else is doing it this year, you know. And so I, I told my family, I said, I think I'm going to drag Christmas in, kicking and streaming this year. You know, we're just going to do it. We're going to go through it. We're going to like it. I, I'm talking about the, the sentimental side of that, you know, the, the nostalgic side of that, the family side of that. I, um, I was thinking about Christmas. And I, you know, the last, um, well, let, let, me, let me go back and just bear with me on memory lane for five minutes. My parents moved a lot when I was a young person. The advantage to that, the advantage to that, is that we celebrated Christmas in a number of different houses and a number of different places. In other words, my grandmother set up her same artificial tree in the same corner of the living room with the same icicle garland stuff and lights with the same skirt around it for 35, 40 years, as far as I know. It never changed. Every Christmas looked identical to the one before, you know. They ate the same thing. We sat at the same place. We had the same tree. Everything was the same. You always put these lights on that railing, and no, no, those lights only go on that railing, and it, right? It was identical, and that's fine. I understand there's a tradition to it, but growing up in my home, because my parents moved, I was born in Baltimore. I lived there till I was five. We moved to Chicago, uh, for four years when my dad was in Bible college and we, we lived in a mobile home. And so my parents um, bought a different tree out there. Remember, in the mobile home, my parents bought a white, pure white Christmas tree with all red lights. And as a kid, I thought that was the neatest thing in the world. You know, I just loved that thing. But, you know, I remember that distinctly, those four years. Two of those years we celebrated in Chicago and my grandparents came out to visit us. Two of those years we traveled back to Baltimore and we got to celebrate at my grandparents' house. So we mixed it up for four years. We then moved back to Baltimore, spent one year there. That was a very memorable Christmas for me. I was in fourth grade. And I remember it very distinctly. I can tell you that's the one year. My mom tears up when I say this. So she's not here, thank goodness. But that is the one year I can tell you every present I got. It was a very distinct year. I'm not going to get into it right now. But it was a very, very distinct year. And it was a year my mom and dad had no money. None. I mean, they were flat broke. They were as poor as could be. And so to my mom and dad, they thought that was the toughest Christmas they ever had. As a kid, it was the greatest Christmas I ever had. And I'll tell you about that some other time. After we moved from Baltimore, we moved up to Pennsylvania, up to central PA where we lived. And we lived in an apartment for a little bit. And then we rented another little house for a little bit. And finally, we moved to a farmhouse. Farmhouse out the other side of Hershey, between Hershey and Elizabethtown. A dentist had bought a farm for his wife's Arabian horses and uh, had a house on it, a farmhouse, and we rented the farmhouse. And so most of my memories are growing up at that farmhouse, you know, the living there. We lived there for seven years, I think, roughly. And uh, uh, my memories of, of being junior high, high school, growing up at that farmhouse. And it was important to me because all those years that we lived there, my grandparents came up and stayed. They were still in Baltimore. They came up and stayed at our house. Which, you know, my dad being a pastor was able to be home around that time. My mom being a, a school teacher was, of course, home at that time. My grandparents came and spent the whole week with us at that time. So the house was full of, of everybody. We were all home. We were off school. Parents were there. Grandparents were there. My mom and grandma would start baking. They'd be baking desserts and all the crazy stuff that they're baking. They were together. And so we're able to do that. My grandfather had one goal. He wanted to go 
to Ollie's Bargain Outlet. <laughs> he thought that was the neatest thing in the world. There was only one. It was in Harrisburg. Uh, ironically, there's now one like just down the street from where he lived in Baltimore. There's one right there, but uh, he didn't live long enough to see that. But at that time, there was one Ollie's Bargain Outlet in Harrisburg, and man, he had to go there. He loved Ollie's Bargain Outlet. And so those are the things I remember, right? Kind of a nostalgic thing. I remember that. I remember my dad setting up trains every year. My dad, that was really important to him. My dad would set up trains. My dad was always a procrastinator. So often my dad would start setting up his trains like December 24th. It would drive my mom insane, you know, because she was decorated the day after Thanksgiving, but my dad would start rearranging stuff December 24th to set up his trains, you know. These are things I remember as a kid, right? We'd have all the family together. My grandparents would be there. Uh, by that time, Bethany and Stephen uh, were born. They were much younger than Brett and I, but uh, they were all born. So we had a house full of people. I remember the, the food, the time. Uh, boy, those were good memories, and that has changed as I've gotten older. Now, Desi and I as we've been married, we, you know, it's been 30 years, and my in-laws will tell you, we don't spend Christmas Day at our house. We still have, you know, we still go to my mom's for, you know, for years and years. We went to, like, my mom's for lunch and her parents for dinner the same day. You know, we'd spend all day Christmas traveling. We didn't spend time at our house as much, and we still don't. But we have those distinct memories and of what Christmas is all about, and even this year, as I, I find, because of, listen, I'm not trying to equate, I'm not trying to equate our losing a dog with some of what you all are going through, but different things have cast different temperatures upon different houses this year, right? You have different things you're going through than maybe you've ever gone through before. And because of that, there's this mindset, well, I'm not in the, not in the mood for Christmas, or I don't feel like I'm in the spirit of Christmas, or I don't feel like I'm ready for it, or I'd rather just get to 2021 and hope that it's a better year, which I preached on that a couple weeks ago. Be careful what we wish for. It may not be, but let's, let's be thankful for the day we have today. Let's be thankful for what we have today. But as we come into Christmas, boy, there's a, a different, maybe a different, quieter, somber, more somber feeling this year. We're not even having all the things at church that we normally do, right? Not having a Christmas dinner, not having a cantata. Not, we're not able to do all that stuff that we're used to doing. It's, just, it's different this year than it's ever been before. And yet, listen, yet, as a Christian first, and as your pastor second, what Christmas is really all about hasn't changed a lick. And, and what Christmas is really all about is just as important as ever. And maybe, listen, maybe this year, this is my challenge, Maybe this year that can move up in priority because all the other stuff is not quite what it used to be or doesn't feel the same as it used to this year. There's always an element of nostalgia, of family, of joy, of memories. But what was the spirit, the original Christmas? You know, what was going on right at the beginning? Last week, last week, we looked at the fact that the world wasn't ready for Jesus. They had no idea he was coming. The innkeeper, of course, no room in the inn. They got shuffled off to a, a stable. Um, I think there was some fear, some concern. I'm sure we talked about this. Mary, Joseph, that was not an ideal setting of where they were going to bring their firstborn into the world. Uh, things were topsy-turvy. Things were not settled. There was... There was great joy in the angels that sang and brought the good news. And there was great joy in the shepherds who saw what happened and, and were, went out. And they, it says they couldn't, I'm paraphrasing, but they couldn't keep their mouth shut, right? They had to tell everybody what they had seen, what they had heard, the excitement of what was going on. And so there were some different emotions that very first Christmas as well. I wanted to look at Simeon this morning. We had Simeon and Anna, we don't talk about them too much uh, here at the latter part of Luke chapter 2, we're more familiar with the first half of the chapter for obvious reasons than the second half. But here we have Simeon and Anna who, listen, they were waiting to see the Lord coming. They were waiting. They were expecting that Simeon had been promised that he wouldn't see death before he saw the Lord, before he saw the Messiah born. It would be nice. It'd be nice. Wouldn't you all agree with this? Wouldn't it be nice if you and I had the promise today 
that we weren't going to die before the Lord came again. That'd be great. That'd be great. I think we're getting close to that, but I haven't had that promise, and I doubt you have either yet. But someday, maybe, we'll be close enough to that. Though, listen, I know the Lord says we know not the hour, the time, the day. He will come as a surprise. But we should be expecting, and we should be anticipating. Simeon was given a promise. You're not going to die before the Messiah comes. So it's going to be in your lifetime. It's going to be while well, your life, this is, I mean, we're, they would really define the calendar for him. This is when the Messiah that's been prophesied about, this is when he's coming. He's going to come before you die. And so here he is at the temple, and Mary and Joseph come in with the child. Now, I don't, we don't see Mary and Joseph saying anything special or announcing anything special, but Simeon knew. He knew who this was. He knew what was going on. The Lord told him. He knew that this is the one that had been promised and prophesied about. And so when he saw, when he saw that the child, uh, he took him up in his arms, verse 28. We read these a little bit ago. He blessed God. Lord, now let us thy servant depart in peace. According to that, mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou prepared for the face of all people. He's a light to lighten the Gentiles. And the glory of thy people, Israel. Here he is, the gift for all people, for all mankind. That's an unusual thing to be said at this time. As here is one that has come that's going to cast light not only on the Israelite people, the Jewish people, God's chosen people, but also all the Gentiles. And I'm going to actually zero in on that uh, phrase, a light to lighten the Gentiles. I'm going to focus on that tonight in my evening lesson. But here we see the excitement. Of Simeon. The words that he goes on to say, though, as he talks to Mary and says, it's, you know, the sword's going to pierce your soul, your heart as well, because we know this, the Savior came to to die. He came to be a sacrifice. This is something that was extremely um, anticipated. The prophets, the prophets had, had proclaimed this. I mean, they were looking with great anticipation at the Messiah coming. This was the Savior. This is the one that would save them from their sins. This is the one that they so desperately needed to come. But that excitement was tempered by the fact that he was going to die. He was going to have to give his life. It wasn't going to be an easy path. It wasn't going to be an easy road. It wasn't going to be a victorious time. It was going to be a time of, of pain. His life, his time on earth, and what he would ultimately do would be of, well, it would be a horrific event as he was crucified upon Calvary and paid the price for our sins. But this is the one. And so you can see the, well, it just seems that at the very first Christmas, whether it was the angels or the shepherds or later the the wise men that came or Simeon or Anna, that the spirit of the very first Christmas was really a spirit of worship. It was a spirit of worship. There, there, there was no sentimental ties to this. There was no nostalgia. There was no family memories yet. That would develop over 2,000 years of celebrating what happened this very first time. But the very first mood or the very first spirit, or the very first reaction at the very first Christmas was one of worship. The angels proclaiming his glory, and the shepherds going to see and telling everyone what they had seen, and the wise men coming to bow before him, and then Simeon blessing God as he lifts up this newborn baby, knowing that this was the fulfillment of prophecy, and Anna as well. Their reaction was one of worship. It was God-directed. It was Christ-directed. It was worship. So, listen, I, I understand that this year is different than all the other ones. That this year, as we come into Christmas, maybe for many of us, maybe for many of you, it's just not quite the same. You're, you're Your family's different, your spouse is gone, your your home situation has changed, your kids aren't there, there's sickness, we we understand. But I, I think we see that the original 
the original mood and the original spirit and the original direction was one of worship. And thank goodness that doesn't change. And that shouldn't change. And maybe, listen, maybe once again as the Lord removes some things from our lives, we can replace it with that which, which, which can be heavenward. We expect, I've said this, you've heard me say this through the years, it's been a while since I preached a message like that, but we, you and I understand, you and I, you and I really get it and understand and expect and want when Christ removes, when God removes bad things from our lives, right? We struggle when it's good things that are gone, when it's important things to us that are gone. And yet, as he takes those things from our lives, he wants us to fill the void, that emptiness or that loneliness or that void of it, with him. With him. I've given that example through the years, but, you know, I, I've uh, uh, I, I try to be a hobby gardener, you know. I try to have a garden, a vegetable garden outside. I do okay. My neighbor does fantastic. My neighbor's a retired uh, a gentleman, he's been retired as long as I've lived there. We've lived there exactly 20 years this month. We moved into this house, and he's been gardening and retired that whole time, and he pours all of his heart, soul, and time and effort into his big, beautiful garden, and he has an abundance of crops. I've always said, you know, I pick up that packet of, like, let's say, corn, the seeds. You know, plant two kernels every six inches. And so years ago, I would say, well, two every six inches, I might as well do four every two inches, you know? More. More is better, right? My corn grows about this high and tassels off, you know? His corn's this high. What, what did I do wrong? Well, I planted, overplanted. They're stealing nutrients from each other's plant. I, I see him go through and uh, uh, thin his crops, thin them, uh, prune his berry bushes and his fruit trees. Cut them back. You know, when we thin or when we cut things back, it, it, it helps more growth. It improves growth. If I let my corn grow four kernels every two inches, it's overplanted. It's not going to grow right. Listen, I, I struggle time-wise and effort-wise pulling the weeds, but I like to see weeds go. I have a hard time pulling a nice new little corn plant, man, he looks good when he's this high. There's just too many of them. Listen, we struggle when God prunes us because he seems to be not only taking the weeds, but he takes the good stuff too. And we st we've lost loved ones and we've lost health and we've lost ability and we've lost time and we've lost things that are precious to us. And we're like, God, why, why, why? But it, it, it increases, it's supposed to, increase growth, our growth in him. And it doesn't feel good, right? I don't like taking my fruit tree and cutting it way back until it looks all stubby. But the next year, it will grow better and increase the productivity of the fruit. And, and that's where we're supposed to be fruitful. I've said that before, you know, that the, the grapevine. The grapevine I have, the grapevine got, a tree fell on it a couple years ago and destroyed it. So the grapevine is a story of the past. But when I used to grow a grapevine, it would grow and, well, you know, it would start to work its way down the, the trellis and things that I had built for it and would really grow and beautiful and provide a lot of shade and nice big leaves and hardly any grapes, you know. A few grapes would come and the birds would take them and that would be it. And, but, you know, you're supposed to prune grapes back, like really prune them back. Why? Because I'm not growing grape leaves, you know. It doesn't matter how beautiful my grape leaves are. I'm supposed to be growing grapes. And I'm content with, look how, boy, look how big that vine grew. Well, whoop-de-doo. Where's the grapes? Well, I don't have any of those, you know. And I, th I think that's our mentality in our lives sometimes that we start to go through life going, well, you know, th think, we like it when things have flourished in our lives. And the Lord said, yeah, but are you being fruitful? And all of a sudden, some things that had flourished in our lives are not flourishing anymore. They're, they're gone. 
because of time, because of death, because of loss, because of age. Some of the things that had flourished are gone, and now we find, Lord, what is it you want from us? The Lord said, I want you to be fruitful. I want you to be fruitful. And so as we come to the Christmas time, man, I understand we may not be in the, in the mood. We may not be in the, the spirit because of memories and nostalgia and, and family or things are different. But the Lord said, listen, it now may be a great time for you to be fruitful, to worship, extra time to focus on Him, extra time to grow in our spiritual life. I, I wrote down, what kind of spirit should we desire? I wrote down one, a spirit focused on others, on others. Um, Philippians 2.4. I do have verses for these. I, I was going to skip them, but I don't want to. Let's look at them. Philippians 2.4. Should be familiar ones, but... Philippians 2.4. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Focused on others. What a great opportunity maybe this year is if we don't have the same... Focus on family or people in our house or activities that we're used to, maybe it's an added time that we can do something for someone else. And maybe we can't go out and be with them like we used to or would want to, but maybe this year is a great time to focus on others and send that card and send that letter and place that phone call and spend that time to focus on other people this year since all the other activities and busyness we're used to are diminished. Maybe our spirit can be a little more outward focused this year, right? Charles Dickens tried to capture that in the story of Scrooge, right? Instead of the epitome of being inward focused, maybe we can be a little more outward focused on the needs of others and things we can do for others and giving to others and helping others. Maybe we can find that as an avenue this year that got lost before because I, I, I'm honest, in my own family, in my own life, Christmas was a busy day and Christmas was, folk, you know, I, Desi and I talked about this. We, I, you know, the most stressful part of Christmas is trying to buy gifts, you know. I don't know if you find that to be the case, but Desi and I are at that age where, you know, we, we're buying gifts for people. You know, we're not receiving gifts, we're buying gifts and we want to and we, we're doing that, but it's so hard to figure out what to get for everybody and what to get for different people, what they need or what they don't need. And everybody you ask says, I don't need anything. And so we find that to be stressful. Like, you know, if you could just, you know, Christmas might be a little more nostalgic if we didn't have that, that, that stress that goes along with, you know, did you get this? Did you get that? And there's always those last couple of days coming up to Christmas when Desi's like, well, you know, well, you got that for the one grandkid. Did you get something for the other one to ma oh, offset it? And did you remember the stocking? And did you pick up that candy? And did you get this? And, and you're running around getting all that stuff. And we get so stressed out sometimes with the busyness of Christmas. How great it would be if we could just really focus on someone maybe outside of that circle that has a need, that has a, a, a that's hurting that we can really reach out to, at least to talk to, at least to share with, at least to, to send them a letter, at least to encourage them this year, maybe more than ever before, as some of that other stuff maybe is diminished. I wrote down, along with that, maybe a spirit of generosity. Acts 20, 35. Acts 20, 20, 35. We could have looked at a couple passages on this, but um, this is where it's kind of summed up, summarized in Scripture. Acts 20, 35, I've showed you all things, how that's so laboring. He ought to support the weak, to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, and how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. More blessed to give. Uh, what an you know, opportunity maybe this year for generosity, because there's probably more people hurting this year. More people struggling this year. More people with job situations and things that aren't uh, the way they have been. And so an opportunity to be generous this year and to show a spirit of generosity maybe, maybe more than, than ever before. 
And then I wrote down, uh, we don't have to turn there, but back in Luke chapter 2, when the angels proclaimed that the Messiah had been born, that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, they said, peace on earth, goodwill toward men, peace. Maybe more than ever, we could just have a spirit of peace this year. That's what the angels proclaimed the first year. That's what, that's what they thought. Boy, when the angels came, they didn't say, all right, now you have a worldwide holiday you can celebrate for thousands of years with lots of lights and trees and gifts and meals. And they said, now with Jesus, you'll have peace. So one, the peace that only Jesus brings when we turn from our sin and put our trust and faith in him alone. That's a peace that only Jesus can bring. So that's first and foremost. But then on top of that, as a Christian, we should have a peace that the world doesn't understand. We should have a peace, the Bible says, that passeth all understanding. A peace in spite of trials and conflict and problems and turbulence. We should be able to have a peace because we know the Lord. Because this world is temporary, because the problems we have are temporary, because we will be with him someday, he's preparing a place for us, we have a future, it is secure, that should bring a peace that passeth all understanding. So I, uh, to summarize, if you were trying to take notes today, good luck. You'll have to watch the tape later, I don't know. But I think we should have a, a spirit of worship, maybe a spirit directed towards others, a spirit of generosity, a spirit of peace, a peace that only the Lord can bring. I wrote down, we're going to celebrate, I'm going to celebrate Christmas no matter how I feel. No matter how I feel. Listen, I, listen this is so important. My Christianity and my faith is not based on feelings. It's based on fact. It's based on the promise of the Word of God. My Christianity is not based on feelings, thank goodness. Or my feelings, because my feelings go up and down. My feelings may change, but it's, it's founded on fact. Listen, I, I'm going to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ no matter how I feel about it. In other words, feel about Christmas, or feel about the season, or feel about the nostalgia, or feel about the time, or feel about the stress. I, not, forget that. Put that aside, I'm going to celebrate Christmas because Jesus Christ came to earth. God Almighty came to walk among us. Emmanuel, God is with us. And we can celebrate that no matter what we're going through, no matter the turmoil in our lives, no matter the topsy-turvy and ups and downs, we can celebrate the fact that Jesus has come. That's the spirit of Christmas. Our dear Heavenly Father,